All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about is apraxia. So apraxia is really the practice of a learned skill. I like to associate the word apraxia with practice. So a specific skill that you ask someone to do. There's two ways that you can test someone for apraxia. One is you can ask them to, you can ask them to perform the movement for you. So show me how you might um, brush your teeth. So they'll do this, you hope. Or show me how you would comb your hair. So they'll pretend they're holding a comb in their hand and comb their hair, whatever it may be. The other way is that you could try to do the lesion yourself and see if they can recognize whether you're doing, doing it correctly or incorrectly. And you can see these after a few different types of lesions, but let's launch into the anatomy of that because I think that's an important thing to get from these last few slides. How does this happen? Well, there's a few lesions or there's a few regions here to pay attention to. One, the first one is here is this inferior parietal lobule. And that is basically where all of that information for those motor programs reside. So think of it as your sheet music for brushing your teeth, combing your hair, using a hammer, whatever it might be. So all that information about recognizing, um, recognizing the right motions or doing those things on your own, it all lives in that area. So let's say you ask, you want to actually do that motion. So there's two options. You can go to your dominant side. So you go to your premotor cortex for your dominant, your right hand. And that information has to go over here. And if that's still intact and if that's working, they're able to do that with their dominant hand. If they want to do something with their non-dominant hand, that information has to go to the opposite side. So it has to cross the corpus callosum. We've talked about that and the importance of that, um, of that structure at the very start of this, uh, of the slide deck. But in order to do, to use things, to perform that motion with their non-dominant hand, that information has to cross the corpus callosum. So I think the easiest way to think about it is what could possibly go wrong. So let's actually work backwards through this. So for number three, we talked about the inferior parietal lobule, and we talked about that being the sheet music for this, um, for your apraxia. So basically, if you have a lesion here, that's the whole kit and caboodle gone. So they can't recognize when you're doing something incorrectly, and they can't do any of the motions that you ask them to with either hand, because all the programming is now gone. The next thing you might see is if you have a lesion on the dominant supplemental motor area. So you're gonna ask someone to do a specific motion with their dominant hand. They're not gonna be able to do it because this area is damaged and they're not gonna be able to physically do that motion with that hand. But if you pantomime something for them because area number three is still working, they'll be able to recognize that you're doing something correctly or incorrectly. I think the tricky one can be number one, if you have a corpus callosum lesion and they have an issue with apraxia with their non-dominant hand, usually the left side, they'll be able to recognize if you're doing something correctly or incorrectly. They'll be able to do something with their dominant hand. But if you ask someone to do something fairly simple with their non-dominant hand, that information can't get across because you have this lesion here. And so you have this disconnect and this apraxia of the non-dominant side. Just remind the students of something I said earlier that apraxia is also one of these syndromes that can involve a colossal deficit, although it doesn't necessarily have to involve it. But I think you've shown a nice case where colossal lesion can cause apraxia of the left hand. So that's that's kind of an important point for the students to know. Yeah, I, for me, you know, both clinically when, when I'm out seeing patients and, and for the purposes of taking tests too, that last part about the corpus callosum, if you're not thinking about that in the context of seeing these patients in the practice, you can completely miss it. So it's always mm -hmm. important to keep that in mind.